Hi everyone, we've got an absolute cracker of a video for you today. We're, we're joined by someone who was described to me earlier as A-League royalty. Ernie Merica, a huge, huge name in Australian football. Um, Ernie, it's a pleasure to have you on the channel. Thank you so much for, for giving up some of your time to chat to us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Enjoy uh, speaking to you, Hamish. I know there's some stuff going on in the background. I think you've got a new pup. So it's, it's busy times at the Merrick household. Yes, up at quarter to six this morning, but the weather's been quite nice, so it doesn't really matter. It's 20 degrees already and it's going to be about 30 today. Very nice. Um, right, I've got a wee spiel I need to read out about you. Um, the inaugural manager of, of Melbourne Victory, a two-time championship winner with, with the Victory. You also managed Wellington Phoenix, Newcastle Jets most recently, as well as the Hong Kong international team. Now, some people will already be wondering about the accent. And you were born in Leith. You were raised in Ayrshire, so there's two Ayrshire legends on this video for, I think, the first time <laughs> in this in this channel's history. Um, we need to do this properly, though, Ernie. So I thought I would bring a wee <laughs> Aussie shirt to the, the party. I've, I bought this about a month ago, and I've been waiting on a, an Aussie guest to come on um, so I could do it. But I've got the Scotland shirt here as well, just in case it's feeling a wee bit left out. Um, covered you, on both sides. <laughs> I know. Do, do you see yourself as, as Aussie, Scottish, or, or both? Well, I came out as a 22-year-old in 1975 um, after teaching for a year in Easterhouse, Glasgow, and going through the Jordan Hill Physical Education College. So I did come out fairly, fairly early in my, my life, and I've spent twice as much time in Australia as I have in Scotland. I just... I've been working on my Aussie accent, and that's why I've got that Aussie twang, fair income sort of twang. In fact, uh, when I was back doing a coaching course in Scotland, the boys were giving me pelters over my Australian accent and saying, run up to the bar, it's your round, Skippy. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need to drop a wee mate into it. That's where you're going wrong. You need to get a yeah. Ange mate in there because he, he loves that. <laughs> yes, he does. He speaks well in the media, though. I've got to hand it to him. He doesn't put up with any nonsense. Yeah, we'll, we'll come on to all of that later. I've got a whole section dedicated to Ange in the media. Before we properly start, though, I read somewhere that you played quite a big part in, in Scott McDonald's early career when you were at the, the Victoria Institute of Sport. Now, Scott McDonald's a regular on the channel. He's on every couple of weeks. Um, what was Scott like as a youngster? In a word, a hooligan, I would say. Really? Yes, he was a, he was a terror. I actually... I recruited him for the Victorian Institute of Sport and the Institute of Sports football program was designed to prepare players for Australian competition at under 17, under 20 level, and then they'd graduate hopefully onto Olympic and senior level. And uh, I'd bring boys in about 14 years old and they moved on about 17 or 18 years old. Some of them went to the AIS, some of them went to national league teams. Scott was, was the same size when he was 14 year old as he is now he <laughs> wasn't much he didn't grow after the age of 15 and uh, he was such a talent that um, the old we didn't have the A League then we had the National Soccer League so he was he was uh, off the bench for a for the National Soccer League a team called Marble Falcons which was coached by Stuart Monroe an ex Rangers player uh, and uh, when I so he trained with me uh, at the VIS and he played at the weekends as a 15 year old he was the youngest player in the national soccer league and he was scoring goals for fun but he wouldn't listen to any of my uh, <laughs> his behavior was sometimes hard to tolerate but then he 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 was picked up by southampton after that gordon strachan picked him up so he's had a tremendous career I've actually texted him this morning or this morning in australia for, for his thoughts on you he's not got back to me yet he's clearly not awake yet what, what would he say about you uh, I don't know, but he's smaller than me, so it better be something good or I'll give him a smack. <laughs> oh, he's not going to like that. Um, we move on to, to the guy we really want to chat about on, on the video, with, with all respect to Scott. It's, it's Ange Postacoglu. How far do you and Ange go back? Well, uh, he was a player in the old National Soccer League for a team called South Melbourne in uh, the 80s. And I, th I was just looking up a game, actually. It was around about 1990. I was coaching a team called Sunshine George Cross and Angie played left back for South Melbourne. And uh, what a game that was. 
I think at one stage we were up three or four nil or four one and the beat is five four and the last cross that came in from Angie who played more of a left wing position than a left back position knocked in across the head of the back post and Puskas was the, the manager of South Melbourne so um, those were exciting times so Angie was a very good player uh, he had a bad knee injury though and he never really recovered from it I think he might have got one game for Australia I suspect he would have got more had he not had the bad injury and in those days they didn't uh, medical science wasn't advanced as it is now but um, then I went from two teams in the old NSL to uh, uh, working at the Victorian Institute of Sport and as I said earlier and Ange um, would recruit me as his assistant to compete to some under 17 under 20 competitions he was the manager of the under 17s and the under 20s i remember going over to vanuatu with him which was really tough playing staying in a five-star hotel trying to qualify through the oceana region for a world cup which we did do so so we we coached together in in the olden days as my kids call it uh, when i was at the vis and then uh, we've been competitors against each other in the A-League. He coached very successfully Brisbane Roar and afterwards he took over at Melbourne Victory after I got the bullet. So um, we've known each other since the late 80s, probably. As you say, you were his assistant for, for the young Socceroos at, at one stage. How did you find that experience, you know, being the assistant to Ange? Um, I think that all coaches are, are different, thank goodness, because if we were all the same, it would be a pretty boring game. But uh, he was good to work with. He was very set in his, his, his game model, how he wanted the game to be played. Uh, he was flexible in allowing uh, fitness people and coaches to get involved, as he does at uh, Celtic. And um, I think everywhere, every year, sorry, every four or five years as a manager, you have to reinvent yourself and continue to keep up with the times, do some professional development. And he's been very good at that. And so he went from uh, coaching in the A-League to the national team, coaching Australia in the Socceroos and qualifying for the World Cup through Asia. Then he went over to Japan with, uh, with Yoko, Yokohama Marinos and his first season didn't have a great year, but they gave him another chance, and uh, which he deserved. It's just in football, you don't usually get a second chance. And he got the second year and won the, the league with them. And I'm not sure if you're aware of the Japanese league, but the standard is very high. I mean, Arsenal picked up uh, Arsene Wenger from the Japanese league. Uh, so he's gone from there over to Celtic, and he's he's continuing to, to work at improving his game in the, the game of the, the Celtic team. And I was just as I said, very impressed with his training session in, uh, in that place that the CIA couldn't find up in the mountains, the other side of Glasgow. How You mentioned there you managed against Angus teams. How did you find that? Because that must have been a pretty tough task, especially against Brisbane Roar, that amazing side. Yes. Um, the, Angie always played an attacking brand of football. Uh, similar to myself, I, I just believe that that's what the fans come for. The only time the fans really got on their feet and get excited is when there's a shot at goal. So if you're not playing attacking football, I don't think you're entertaining the crowd. You're not going to bring the crowds in. And he's always played that brand of football. So uh, there were always exciting games. In fact, uh, when he, he went on a run of uh, tw 20 games undefeated at Brisbane Roar, Mm -hmm. And uh, I was up, I think, 2-1 in one of his last games and looked like breaking that run. And in the dying minutes, our goalkeeper kicked the ball out short and went to one of their strikers and they got the equaliser. So his run continued. But I think his brand of football is the way that most of us should be playing it, given that we have the players to do it. But even if you don't have the players, I think it's, it's the only way to go out and play the game and entertain and bring the crowds in. Yeah, and he's certainly done that in Glasgow. What You've already kind of touched on this, but when you heard about Ange becoming the new Celtic manager, because it all happened quite quickly, what did you think? Did, did it seem like a good fit? I thought it was a great move for him. I mean, Japan is uh, the football standard and facilities and level of professionalism is very high. But uh, Scotland, with being with Rangers or Celtic, it's a different 
different game altogether. It's very competitive, mm -hmm. very fast. And I thought if if he was going to learn a different aspect of the game, it's coping with that style of football, which is a thousand miles an hour. And there's, uh, well, in the old days, the tackling usually occurred above the neck, but now the tackling has improved in Scotland and uh, the quality of games and skills that come out now are terrific. And it's great to see not only Ange is a, an Australian doing well, but Tommy Rogic doing well. Yeah. He's got the best out of Tommy. And um, and that, that speaks well of Australian football. I think if he'd been a major failure, which there was no chance of happening, but if he had, then it wouldn't have reflected well on Australian coaches and Australian players. But uh, he's done a great job. Yeah, that was a, a real topic of conversation. We, we had a, a few Aussies on when Ange was being appointed and you could almost feel the, the pressure that they were feeling that... that and has to succeed here because if he doesn't, it might set us back a good few years. It seems a long time now um, ago, but when Ange was first rumoured to be the Celtic manager, there was a lot of speculation that he didn't have the UEFA pro licence needed to manage in Europe. Of course, that turned out to be complete nonsense. And I believe he actually got his UEFA badges at a similar time to you. Is that correct? He's a little bit after me, but... Um... I, I can't understand why there's this discussion over qualifications when FIFA control the game worldwide and all confederations are under FIFA. So if you do an Asian license, it should be accredited in every part of the world. I happened to do one in Scotland through uh, Craig Brown mm -hmm. and um, met up with a few characters in Scotland, a few managers there and had a great time. But uh, I, I feel as though... Australian qualifications, Asian qualifications should be accepted anywhere and I'm not sure what the outcome was but he's there coaching and that's what he should be doing. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll, we'll fast forward to your visit to, to meet Ange recently, November, I think it was. How, how did that come about? I, uh, my mother is still going strong. She's in a care home in Kilmarnock, just around the corner from Rugby Park. We normally, my brother, older brother and younger sister go over and visit my older sister and my mother and the family um, every May, usually at the end of the football season. Uh, May is, and it's my mother's birthday there then. But um, it had been nearly two years since we'd been over because of the COVID situation. We couldn't get out of the country or nor back in. So um, we decided all of a sudden just to have a family get together in the last two weeks of November, travelled over, and um, I thought I'd catch up with Angie. He was very obliging. I went to the training session. He invited me to the the, um, the Celtic Aberdeen game the following weekend after he'd played against Bayer Leverkusen, I think, on the Thursday night. But having uh, knowing that I was there to see my mother first and foremost, I didn't want to be in a massive crowd of 60,000 people, which I suspected was going to help happen at Celtic Park. So instead, I went to watch Air United, my brother-in-law's favourite team, uh, Graham Peterkin. But um, no, he, he really looked after me and um, we had a really good chat. I caught up with Peter Houston, who was on my coaching course. And uh, I think it was Steve McManus, who I tried to sign for Wellington um, uh, Phoenix. Uh, I hadn't met him personally, but I'd spoken to him on the phone, so... It was funny catching up. You just, it's a small world. You catch up with so many good people in the sport. Yeah. What what kind of um, feeling did you get around Lennox Town? Was it a feeling of, of people working really hard, all, all, you know, going the same direction, pulling in the same direction? It was uh, the, the first thing that struck me was the level of professionalism, immaculate facilities, players turned out in the, the, the right gear, doing a thorough warm up with a fitness coach smoothly going into the first uh, drill exercise, which was very tight, sharp feet, quick passing, and then that developing into a, a, a 11 v 11 game on sort of three quarter, seven eighths of a pitch, a little bit shorter pitch with rules regarding who can go into defensive areas and, and that sort of thing. And watching the players really, especially the good players like Jota and uh, uh, Kyogo, boys that um, are, are getting a big name at Celtic in Scotland in general and um, watching their level of commitment and the, just the level of work rate and the quality of finishing was just terrific to watch. It was really quite inspiring.
Yeah, and the intensity as well, is is that something you, you thought was quite good? Well, that's the difference, isn't it? Uh, the higher up you go in football, the quicker everything occurs, rapid decision-making, quick, accurate passing, movement off the ball, uh, runs in behind, strikes, you know, before you can blink, there's a strike on goal. So the intensity and speed of the game was first class, and it was an extra training session I'd managed to squeeze in just before the flew over to Germany. And uh, given that they're playing that type of high intensity football week in, week out. I was just very impressed they put it in at training as well. Right. Did you get the impression Ange is enjoying himself, that he's really in his element at Celtic? Yes, he, he was all rugged up, so he's got the hang of what to wear <laughs> in the weather. And uh, and he, he, he did say he was really enjoying it, and I found out where he was living, which is a similar part of where I lived when I was a student at PE college, and it's a good area. And uh, He's, he's enjoying what he's doing, but uh, there's no doubt that there's pressure on week in, week out. When you coach a team like Celtic, you've really got to win every week. You can't get away with a couple of draws in a row or anything like that. So he's used to it because he dealt with that with the Socceroos. Mm -hmm. The qualification for the World Cup came in the last game or two, really. And uh, so he was under pressure there. He, he won the championship with uh, Yokohama. He was under pressure there. So he's used to that pressure. In fact, I think you thrive on it after a while and miss it when you don't have it. So he's enjoying himself. Very interesting. Um, right, I want to chat a wee bit about Ange and, and the media. Um, I mean, I, I've got this weird theory, and, and so does my colleague Ewan, that Ange secretly enjoys dealing with the media. That when you see him, he, he often seems like he wants to put them in their place. Um, and, he, and he certainly has done that a lot recently. But he does it with like a glint in his eye. Have you got any thoughts on that? Do you think he almost enjoys the media? I think he, he likes the toing and froing with the media personalities. And I, th I, I think a coach has got to manage the media because really your connection with the fans and the supporters and the members are through the media 90% of the time. So how you come across the media makes a big difference to your fan base. And, and you, you want to give out information about what's happening with the team. You can do that on website and the club website, etc. But I think fans enjoy watching media coaches performing in the media. And to be honest, I think the media can destroy coaches, even though the coaches might be successful. So he's he's learned to deal with it really well. Again, that's a professional development area we all go through because there's no way to learn other than be in difficult circumstances. But he, he, I liked his comment once when... Uh, when someone from uh, one of the television stations asked him, uh, you know, did he feel as though he's back in with a good challenge now that he'd won a particular game? And he said, well, I thought it was all over, mate. He said mm. it was all over. You know, we'd lost a couple of games, so we'd, it was all over. Now you're asking me how I feel about where we are in the league in second spot. So he, he handles that quite well, but he doesn't overdo it because you know what happens if you overdo it with the media. They get you back. <laughs> At some yeah. stage, they'll get you. But uh, I think the media has been good to him and uh, the fans enjoy it. In fact, it was, I couldn't believe the number of Celtic fans within my friendship group in, in Scotland when I was there. And my nephew is a mad Celtic fan and they love the way he deals with the media. And that's, I, th I think, a very important role for a manager, handling the media well and getting the right messages out and yet not taking any nonsense from them. He, he comes across so well. He's so honest as well. We, we've had managers in the past that have been good managers and, and quite media savvy as well, but a lot of the time they were maybe telling you one thing and doing another thing. Ange just seems incredibly honest. Is, is that the case, knowing him as well? Honesty is, is definitely, he's very strong in that area. And so it's a case of this is what's happening, whether you like it or not, this is what's going to continue to happen. And it's backfired a little bit with um, with the national team, but he, he proved his worth by getting them into the World Cup Although after the qualifiers, he called it quits. I suspect there was something more to it than that there was a reason why he didn't want to coach in the finals. Maybe it was support from above. You know what it's like. As a manager, you've got to manage down, but you've also got to manage up. So dealing with boards and chairmen and that sort of thing is another area that I think he's improved in out of sight because that's a difficult area in Japan where respect is very highly regarded, and he handled that really well. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, 
Do you think he pays attention to what the media say? Is he the type of manager who will keep track of what's been written and said about Celtic or will he just shut it all out? Well, I'm afraid I can't answer. Really, that's the question for him. I don't really know. I just I, I know a couple of things that he's disappointed with and it's not so much the media. It's maybe some ex-players that are having a go at their old club. And uh, that's a no-no here in Australia and I'm sure it's a no-no in Britain as well. But for an ex-player to continually have a go at the performance of the club, that's there, there's obviously you know ill will, bad will there. That not against Ange, against the club. But um, I can't really answer the question. You'd have to speak to him about it. I'm sure he doesn't read every single thing in the newspaper, because if he did that, you'd go a bit crazy. I want to chat to you about another fella who came close to signing for Celtic recently, Riley McGree. Um, people will have seen the video of his iconic scorpion kick, and you were actually his manager that night. In fact, the, the camera goes to you and, and you are you were sitting down enjoying the goal. I don't know how you didn't manage to, to go crazy when that went in, because it's the most amazing goal ever. Um, but it was just an incredible strike, wasn't it? It was an incredible strike. Uh, the reason I didn't go wild is... That I hate it when the players watch the English Premier League and all the spectacular goals from Ronaldo in the top right-hand corner and top left-hand corner from 30 metres, 35 metres. So whenever I manage and coach a team, I get them to get into goal-scoring areas, one and two touch, side foot is fine. I can't stand tricks and flicks, especially from the outside, outside of the box. Mm -hmm. So I'd just spoken about that many times and sure enough, the ball come into him. <laughs> He's just on the edge of the box and he flicks over his head and I thought, what a waste of time. And then he, it went in the goals and then I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not smiling. I'm not going to smile. <laughs> but I, probably, I probably did the wrong thing. I, probably, I should have smiled and enjoyed it because it was a great goal. It got us into the grand final and we played my old club, Melbourne Victory, in the grand final after that. And that was against Melbourne City, which is owned by Manchester City. So... Those were those were good days, and Riley was just a pleasure to work with. He's great to coach. Soaked up everything. Nineteen years old he was at the time, just turning twenty, and he was an incredible player. I couldn't understand why we had him on loan, loan from Club Bruges, and I spoke to the recruiting person, and he says, "Well, we don't think he's good enough." And I felt like saying, "You got no idea, pal. <laughs> he's boy, he's a good player." Yeah, were you surprised he didn't join Celtic and Ange? It's hard to know what's going through the mind of these players, and uh, and he's a, he obviously has spoken to his agent and his family, and they thought that uh, the championship is best for him. I don't know if it is or not, but the thing is, he's got to play. Uh, if he's not playing, he's not going to continue to develop. And uh, the advice I give all youngsters coming over, I said, look, even if you go to a big club, that's great, but you've got to play. I I, I had a goalkeeper at. Uh, at Melbourne Victory called Mitch Langerak. What a goalkeeper this kid was. And uh, he got offered to sign at Borussia Dortmund. And I said, don't go there, go to another club. And he said, so I tried to stop the signing. Anyway, he went to Borussia Dortmund. He was on the bench and he, he was only about 21 years old. He was on the bench several seasons straight away. So he was picking up big money, but it stopped him really from developing as a player. And um, he never really got to the level he should have got to. Now he's in Japan and he's playing his best football, but he's he's not interested in playing for Australia anymore. I think he's just past that level. He's not he's at the level, but I think Matt Ryan's doing a great job there. But I I you know does this is it going to help my development? Is, do I go for the money? Is it am I going to do? I, I think a lot of players should pick the manager they're going with and the honest managers that tell them, yes, you're going to play and they stick with their word or you have to earn your spot or you're not going to play in the first season. And the manager might have been the one that convinced them to, to stay or go, but he would have done very well at Celtic for sure under Ange. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I lived in Stuttgart in Germany for a couple of years and I'm pretty sure Langerak was the, the keeper there when, when I lived and, and saw them for half a season. Um, yeah, j just finally, another thing I read in, in the article you spoke about, you, I think at the time you said Celtic will win a trophy this season and then a couple of weeks later we won a trophy. Do you think we're going to win the league under Ange this season? I can't predict that, that far forward. I mean, Rangers are a very good team and uh, they're hard to beat. They don't lose many games. 
it will come down to the Rangers Celtic matches and Angie's only just started there. I don't know if he's had enough time to really bed in the new players that he's bought. If he's picked up, it's interesting, you know, a coach that comes from a different uh, country. Like Arsene Wenger was the first to come in from, you know, although he was recruited from Japan, he, he had coached Monaco and in the French league. And so he brought in a lot of French players, you know, Thierry Henry and all these players that no one knew about. Mm -hmm. And just brought in a number of top level players from Japan. So if they bed in well, he doesn't have too many injuries, he'll certainly give it a go. But it'll be touch and go between the two of them. I think if I was a gambling person, I would probably put my money on Ange winning it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, Ernie, we'll, we'll leave it there. We've got you booked in for a, an appearance in May uh, with Ange next to the trophy. The trophy, you and Ange, that would be a, an ideal uh, photograph. And, and thanks so much for giving up some of your time to chat to us. Oh, thanks, Hamish. It's my pleasure. I really enjoyed it.